Sambuddhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Okay, friends, so now is the time for the Dhamma talk. So, what is the Dhamma? Of course, we've already been uh, discussing that, of course, for uh, means the teachings of the Buddha, at least for Buddhists, teachings of the Buddha. But then you might ask, well, what did the Buddha teach? Well, he taught the Dhamma. So what is the Dhamma? It's what the Buddha taught. What the Buddha teach? Dhamma. Who would come first, the chicken or the egg, the Buddha or the Dhamma? Anyway. Uh, so as most of you probably know, the Dhamma is about sort of the laws of nature, about the body and mind. And especially about how body and mind operate and function uh, along the lines of with the, the law of karma and especially in terms of how the actions of our body and mind either bring happiness or they bring uh, suffering so this is a natural law not something the Buddha made up so basically that law of karma is most people know, or excuse me, it's a, the, called the law of karma. The law of karma is similar to the law of gravity. If you throw something up, what happens? Comes down, sometimes with a big thud, right? <clears throat> and so if you throw something out of your mouth, it goes out in the world and goes through other people's bodies and minds, causes some reaction in them, and comes back to us in good old Newton's law. Canadians, you know, good old Newton, right? Sir Isaac. What did he say? Anybody know Newton's law? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right. Okay, well, that's sort of similar to the law of karma. If you throw hatred out, then some kind of hatred or uh, negative vibration comes back to us. If we put out loving kindness, friendliness, other good quality things, then at least less suffering comes back and uh, more well-being and happiness. <clears throat> so, you know, that's really sort of the underlying motivation uh, what the Buddha, you know, why he taught the Dhamma. And then, of course, there's the other law of nature is impermanence, that everything that arises from a cause ceases, that everything is continually changing. Our bodies are changing, our mind is changing, and undergoing a change and uh, evolution and mutation based on those uh, uh, actions and, and thoughts. <clears throat> so the, the, you know, the ultimate cause of, of suffering, or one of, one of the main ones that we normally talk about, is that you know, the root of those, uh, all the problems and suffering that we have is due to greed, hatred, and delusion are basically qualities or conditionings within our consciousness that have, have accumulated you know, for a long time. But now I want to, so you know, the practice of Dhamma is how to you know, change those negative actions that bring 
problems and suffering to more wholesome, positive ones that again bring more happiness. Because it's, it all lies within the mind. Uh, but it's not easy to you know, get hold of our mind. But I want to, you know, go back and actually, you could say to the beginning and try to understand what is this mind? And how did it actually start? And also, what is the past and what is the future? What creates it? <clears throat> so, uh, I'm gonna, how many of you like to take a little journey? Like to take a little journey? Back, back to the womb? Back to conception? Okay, so just to kind of try to follow this uh, line of thinking. So at the time of conception, you know, mother and father produce some DNA in a little uh, new uh, one-celled, uh, what do they call it, a zygot or something like that? I don't know what a biological name, but anyway, a new uh, being, the essence of a being is started. And at that same time, consciousness has come and kind of, you know, activated that because if consciousness doesn't join with that uh, those material elements then there'll be a you know a miscarriage or that you know the, the baby won't uh, develop so the consciousness coming from somewhere else a previous life uh, is le like the spark you know that uh, activates the the process of cell division and the growth of the, the baby. So for nine months, that one cell organism went through cell division. And with each cell division, that consciousness that was there also goes into each of those uh, cells. And so by the time of nine months, there's multi-billion cells, maybe even a trillion now, I don't know what the count is, but uh, <clears throat> and all of those cells have consciousness and they're all connected in the inner internet. It means all those cells can talk to each other. Cells in the toe, something happens there, and, you know, Send signals to the brain, say, hey, this has happened, you know, come on, do something. And triggers off all kinds of things. There's a whole alive process in that. And uh, it's called natural wisdom. And this, uh, this human organism, which is the most evolved uh, organism that we know of to date, right, uh, uh, <clears throat> has come to be through that and a natural uh, wisdom. It could make something this marvelous as a human being with all these marvelous interconnected systems of respiration, metabolism, circulation, uh, you know, immune system, and so many others. Uh, that all of that uh, occurred through natural wisdom. And it also occurred basically in the present moment. And the body and mind were basically evolving together, they were intimately connected. You know, they were kind of fused into one. They weren't different. But then what happens at the time of birth? Baby comes out, the doctor you know, cuts the cord. Now the baby gets disconnected from that direct life force. Now it's a separate little being. Then the parents give it a name. 
you know, little Johnny, little Susie, and then all the relatives come over and want to hold it, you know, Gucci, Gucci, good. Uh, give it all this attention. And, you know, then start calling it its name. So over several months or longer, I don't know how long it actually takes, but at some point, if they're calling its name so many hundreds, thousands of times, you know, baby starts to look when they call the name. So what does that signify? Now it's it's hearing some sound, and now it's thinking that sound must, you know, refer to this thing here. But it keeps on happening so many times. And you know, the the consciousness of a baby is basically oceanic. That means it doesn't have a a little focus of a of a self in it yet. No centralized little focus uh, that that sees objects and knows what they are. So the baby's mind is like a blank slate so to speak, because we all know the baby brings karma with it from a past life, but still at the time of birth, it doesn't know anything. And uh, that consciousness is just more or less kind of a pure awareness. But then, as things happen, and say that at some point, the, a sweet grandmother comes by and gives the baby its first chocolate and so that you know, the baby tastes the chocolate it gets a, a big grin on its face so that's a pleasurable feeling it's feeling a pleasurable sensation and maybe the uncle or father or somebody else uh, you know holds the baby maybe too tightly or doesn't give it anything and the baby might get a painful feeling from from that, or maybe it, it doesn't give it anything, and so it has a kind of a, an indifferent feeling. So these things happen over and over, and it starts to recognize things that bring it discomfort or pain, and things that bring it pleasure. Like its mother, you know, holding it very sweetly and talking sweet words and, and all that. So there's a, that uh, pleasant feeling, you know, with the mother. But maybe the cat comes by. You know, the baby grabs the cat's tail. The cat turns around and scratches. The baby gets a pain. Now it identifies that object is a source of pain. And it doesn't want to be with that in the future. And so all these instances of things bringing it discomfort or pain and other things bringing it comfort or pleasure, uh, then it, it starts to want that particular face or object to come in the future that brings it pleasure. And it doesn't want that object that brought us discomfort or pain to come in the future. Because it's remembering from before. And so this is the birth of the past and future. This is where past future is born, in the mind. And normally when people talk about past or future, uh, people just think it's, I don't know, some places or something like that. But actually it's in the mind. And <clears throat> then we start craving the future and you know w not wanting certain objects you know fearing the past or especially the painful objects coming to us in the future so, so it you know it doesn't want those painful objects to come in the future but it wants it has craving and desire uh, for the, the objects that bring us uh, pleasure and so it starts to think now about more about the future. Now it's in the beginning it was fused with the body, you know, for the first six months or so of the life. 
you know, the mind was still basically in the present moment. How many of you mothers have experienced that with your babies when they were very young? How their, their minds are kind of just wide open, and things are coming and going, and you know, that big smile on their face. But you know, certainly they might cry because of some pain or so, but that's kind of instinctual. But now, little by little, as they, you know, as they get to be a crawling age, right? They start to crawl. Then they start seeing things. And the mind is now going after that object, you know, because now the the accumulated greed and karma, so to speak, from the previous life, now it was dormant uh, for the first uh, six months or a year of a baby's life because its senses weren't developed yet. Uh, but now then those uh, things, uh, you know, come back. But... <clears throat> So the baby loses that connection with the body. It starts to think about the future. It's no longer you know, connected to the body. And so it's thinking about the future. And that is, you know, basically the cause of suffering. Because it loses that connection with the present moment. And now it's depending on the future for its happiness. And <clears throat> so it starts, and because of impermanence, those he may get the, that the baby might get pleasure. I can't say he or her anymore because of certain <laughs> new developments, but so call it it or something. But that person, let's say. Uh, So they, they, they need, you know, they've lost that happiness of the present moment. Now they are, are need as objects that bring it, uh, you know, pleasure. And then because of impermanence, they change and it needs, it needs more. Basically because it's lost that happiness of the present moment connection. And you know, greed and hatred then start, uh, you know, developing more and more. And whenever it feels something, feels pain, and it has anger or hatred, uh, aversion to those objects. And because of that, the, the more pain or aversion it has, it, it wants to escape into pleasurable feeling. That's it. It's only escape. And when you escape and have more desire and greed for pleasurable feeling, you increase the idea of things that you don't like, because those are the two dualities, pleasure and pain. One can't exist without the other. You don't know, the only reason you know pleasure is because of pain, because the mind is comparing these. So anyway, this, you know, this process keeps growing and growing as the child uh, grows up and gets more, you know, complex. And of course, the whole of society basically is, is feeding that uh, also. And the more the baby thinks about, the person thinks about the future, the further they get away from uh, their truth, that means the, the present moment. And they lose that natural wisdom. And, you know, they, they start to do things that harm the body. And because of the, the desire for pleasurable feeling. And because of the way society is, you know, now all this food, they, you know, put MSG and all other, make, make food taste better and better and better, right? <laughs> Get people to have more uh, attachment and craving, which you know, harm the body. I mean, that's just one example. Uh, And so because of that, we do things that actually interfere with the natural functioning of, of the body. That means of the different systems, the immune system, the metabolism, and so on, because of a lot of impure substances that are brought in. 
uh, the the natural immune system and so on starts to not function so good, and people start having you no know, problems. Uh, so I'll take the example of a, a young person who started uh, maybe smoking when they were a young teenager. Now I tell this from my own example. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, because of peer pressure, you know, young teenagers, they want to be part of the group, you know, and the big person. And so they just start picking up bad habits and they start smoking. And after some months or maybe longer, you know, the body starts from <coughs> coughing. So what is that telling you? That something's not good for you, right? Something's happening. And the person goes to light up a cigarette, you know, and the body's saying, oh, don't do that, don't do that. But the mind, the mind says, shut up. Right? Or with so many other kind of substances. And this is what, you know, just keeps compounding uh, the problem. And basically, it's been done because we've lost that sensitivity to the body. We're no longer in touch with it. And then we're consuming things that interfere with the natural functioning of the body and, uh, you know, create uh, those kind of problems that people then take with them uh, most of their life. So, <clears throat> you know, that is really the well, I like to call, you know, the cause of suffering is usually said to be craving. But, you know, that's, that's the immediate sort of uh, cause. But behind that, it's, it's ignorance and not knowing the truth. And I like to say that, you know, the cause of suffering is that disconnect from the body. It means a disconnection from the present moment and being caught now in the past and the future. And past and future is directly connected with pleasure and pain. And that's why we, we every time you have pleasure and pain, you go on reinforcing the idea of past or future and making it something more real and real and real. And get further and further away from the present moment. So the Buddha saw this, and he understood that phenomenon, and that's why he devised you know, the, the practice of meditation and the four foundations of mindfulness to reestablish that connection to the body. And again, when I say body, I automatically mean the present moment. And, and the practice of uh, the mindfulness. So it's, it's uh, you know, important to, to understand how that uh, situation of our mind has developed. Because when you understand how something has evolved, then you understand how it can devolve or they can kind of you know go back to the uh, to the source <clears throat> and so the you know the practice of uh, meditation or the way that the Buddha uh, treated the uh, you know his, his search for the for the truth, you know, he, he saw it as a scientific experiment. Because, you know, as a, a prince, he was also thinking about the cause of suffering. And then when he, that's what caused him to renounce uh, the world. And then he started going around uh, the, you know, asking others, you know, what the source of suffering was. Or you know their the version of the truth, but as we all know, he wasn't satisfied. He visited 
teachers that taught him how to attain formless jhanas, like infinite space, wow, infinite consciousness, wow, you know, nothingness. And so, you know, <laughs> the, the ascetics of his time, that's the kind of meditation they did. And then they thought that that was God. You know, they enter a state of uh, jhana or formless consciousness and their mind filled with infinite light. And they just assume that's the creator of the world or some kind of God or something. And the Buddha, you know, tried those meditations and he perfected them. But when he come out of those meditations after a while, after that initial euphoria subsided, he realized his mind hadn't really changed very much. We asked those teachers, is that all you got? And he said, they said, yeah. So, you know, he kept on going around asking several different teachers and he got the same sort of reply. Each one with a little bit higher type of meditation, but still the kind of meditations that didn't really transform uh, the consciousness. So, you know, that's why he, he left them and, and went and sat under the Bodhi tree. We all know that story, right? And that's when he went back to watching the bread. And then he said, why should I go around asking all these other people where the truth was? So he saw that beautiful Bodhi tree in Bodhgaya. He said, let me sit down here. And where he turned his attention, you know, back inside you know, to the breathing and, you know, reverse that process, uh, you know, went step by step back inside to, to discover the source of consciousness. And what he discovered was he went back to that point where consciousness initially started, uh, you know, dividing into past and future. And he saw that, you know, he got back to the present moment awareness and the dissolution of the ego consciousness. So, you know, so that, that's the Buddha taught uh, or treated meditation as, you know, a scientific experiment. And so he, you know, used the breathing to. You saw how the, the mind was mostly just out there in the world. And so he used the, the breathing to bring the mind back to uh, the body. And then going into the body to feel the sensations. And then saw how the, the sensations, the pleasurable and painful sensations, were what actually was triggering off all of his thoughts. Because all of our thoughts are connected to the past and the future or the pleasure and pain, almost every one of them. Uh, with the memory of whatever you've seen, heard, smelled, tasted, touched, thought about, uh, almost probably 95 or 99 percent of them are connected in one way or other with some kind of uh, unpleasure or pain or uh, pleasure. <clears throat> And then he, he went back to, uh, you know, was able to uh, get the mind to flip back into that non-dual awareness where there's no more pleasure in, in pain or no more past and future and understood that as being, a, you know, a, really the, the true nature of, of the mind and uh, could be developed into a, a permanent kind of uh, realization. So anyway, that's, and now just I was explaining all that just to kind of get a, a larger picture of viewpoint of what we're up against when we're, you know, going, you know, meditating and dealing with all the various types of thoughts and feelings uh, that are, you know, that are coming up. Now people are struggling. So 
uh, difficult and uh, you know trying different ways to overcome their pleasure and pain but you know ways that don't really provide a permanent kind of uh, solution As we, I think I mentioned yesterday, that you know almost all our uh, problems and and sufferings, or at least the, you know like to the physical body and so on, are caused by unmindfulness and by the greed. So because of that, we consume things. You know, people want to eat food for taste, and they get the chemicals that come with that and problems. Or they listen to too much loud music. And, you know, turning up Led Zeppelin to 100 decibels and damage your ears so they're going to go deaf in their old age. Or, you know, breathing all this pollution and damage their lungs and smoking. Uh, just, you know, you all know that. So most all of our senses, if we abuse them, just seeking pleasure through the senses, you know, they're going to cause some kind of, uh, you know, problem. And so, you know, the whole teaching and practice of the Dhamma about learning how to uh, understand that and then learning how to reconnect to a, a consistent level of happiness that doesn't rely on those senses you know, that comes from within, which is basically that present moment, that vibration of the present moment, the, the, the subtle sensations in the body that are, that are always there. And that's why the mindfulness of the body and the four foundations of mindfulness Is a, I mean, the four foundations of mindfulness is a complete, you know, teaching in that regard, in, in, our, in uh, coming back to that <clears throat> state of the natural mind. And <clears throat> the, so the, the breathing awareness gets you to to come to the outside of the body, right? You're doing the, you know, observing the breath, however you're doing it, whether you feel the touch of air at the nostrils or you feel the expanding and contracting here. Basically, that's the surface of the body. So you're bringing air from the outside. And then it gets to the, you feel the surface. So you're bringing your mind to the, the surface of the body because usually it's floating around out there. You're looking at that, looking at that. The eyes are glued and wanting to see everything. Uh, so you bring it back and say, oh, yes, sitting, sitting. Breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting, breathing in, standing, breathing out, standing. So you, first of all, you just get to the surface of the body. But then as you stay with the surface of the body longer and longer, then you start to feel stuff under the skin, you know, subtler sensations, like the pulse of blood or other types of you know, sensations. And you keep your attention on the body and you start feeling so many of these sensations. And some of them are pleasant and some of them are painful. So now you can observe how the mind desires those pleasurable feelings and tries to get away from the painful one. And you see how the, the mind is trapped in that, uh, in that process. But then you can also understand that you can learn to endure painful feelings longer by relaxing around them and not, uh, you know, uh, giving them a reality and learning how to see how they change. See, because of impermanence, 
we think nothing's going to change. I mean, intellectually, we know things are going to change. But when it's actually happening, when it occurs, like a toothache or, you know, some other uh, strong pain, we're just assuming that it's going to last for, for a long time. And so that desire to, you know, get rid of it. And we, we see that that pain belongs to this body, and this body belongs to me. That's actually how suffering arises. First, you experience an unpleasurable feeling, but you identify it as happening to this body or happening to the mind. And then this mind and body, you're identifying as me. That's my body. That's my mind. And it's the I, again, that separate little I now that struggles. And that, that whole phenomena there is really the essence of how the mind has got caught in the suffering. And Buddha saw that very clearly. It's because of identifying these things as being I and me, just like the baby did, you know, when it was, uh, started to, to grow up. Uh, so anyway, the um, so all the different aspects of mindfulness of the body. I think most of you have read the mindfulness of the body sutta. How many people have read all of it? So the Buddha, you know, he starts with the breathing, and that gets you centered in the body, and then you actually then start to, to know the posture, okay, the sitting. The body is sitting. Now you, you go from the breathing to the body, standing, walking. That keeps your attention in the present moment. Then you go to movement, <clears throat> mindfulness and clear comprehension. And then you also go to the elements, the four elements, or the 32 body parts. Now, a lot of people in Sri Lanka, they call this pilikul bhavana, right? Pilikul, pilikul. Like an impure. But uh, that is simply just to kind of, uh, kind of get some uh, detachment to the body. But it's really, to me, it's not the important part. But a lot of Sri Lankans think that's the important part. Pilikul, pilikul. But the important part is it keeps your attention in the present moment. I say, okay, my hand, you no know, foot, liver, kidneys. That means you're keeping your attention in the body, which is the present moment. Uh, and then those body parts, even the idea of body parts dissolves, and you just feel the, the four elemental vibrations of, of earth, fire, water, air. And, but those are just ways that energy manifests itself. And then, you know, in the mindfulness of the body, you can break the solid body down. Like at the time of birth, there was just one cell there. And uh, so you break it down. This body is really just billions of cells. And those cells are vibrating. And if so many cells are put together, they form something that you can actually touch and feel, called earth element. And if they form some kind of fluid, it becomes a water element. Or if it forms some kind of heat or temperature, it's the, you know, the temperature element, heat element. Or if it creates motion, you know, it's the wind element. So actually, all those four elements are just vibrations. And uh, this is a, also an important aspect of developing the, uh, the right comprehension, mindfulness and clear comprehension. Uh, so a lot of people talk about mindfulness, mindfulness, mind, just be mindful. Well, 
Anybody can be mindful, but it's the clear comprehension that makes it right mindfulness. You know, uh, so it's a clear comprehension of understanding the nature of what you're observing. Uh, so this idea of seeing everything as just vibration is an aspect of the investigation of dumb. So in the mindfulness practice, you know, we're practicing mindfulness, but it's not just noting things coming and going, but it's also developing that understanding of the impermanence and also the underlying nature of what we are, you know, reacting to and clinging to. As a, ultimately, they're just vibrations, cellular vibrations. And so, uh, so this body is comprised of billions of cells. What are cells comprised of? Before that, molecules. You know, to break it down and you know, bit by bit, right? There's cells, and many molecules make up a cell, and many many atoms make up a molecule, and then many many electrons make up an atom. You can see if you break it down in that way, it comes down to the essence of just being electricity, right? That's why they call it an electron. And it's a, you've got electricity, you've got current. So what that means is that everything is just basically energy. That's why Einstein's the theory of, you know, energy, everything is just energy, mass. And... Uh, but, you know, a lot of people think, oh, that's just a theory, that's just a theory. No. It is a theory, but it's a reality, too, if you are able to shift your attention to that. You know, get away with this idea of thinking everything is just solid and real things in mind. You have to change the attitude toward it. Uh, which creates a you know a paradigm shift in the consciousness. Now I hope this is not you know kind of going over your heads or not because I know a lot of you've been meditating for a long time, so you should at least have some kind of idea about it. But you know it's uh, in the the insight meditation. It's a it's an integral part of whether the mind just gets stuck in a mediocre level or it kind of goes deeper to understand the, you know, deeper levels of mindfulness and concentration. So, uh, so there's four foundations of mindfulness getting, uh, you know, centered in the body and then understanding how everything is just vibrations and then and that's not only of the body it's also things that you hear and see and uh, taste and touch and even think about you know because modern biology and science tells us that now right now you're hearing a sound right what do you what comes to your mind? Bantaru Rahula is talking. Right? So you're not hearing a sound, you're hearing Bhante Rahula talking. You're not hearing a sound. Or if you hear that, somebody clap. No, it's just a sound. Uh, because when you start identifying it as some kind of particular object, then because of the past, you start developing, well, I don't like Bhante Rahula, or Bhante Rahula is a great, gives great talks. And, you know, everyone's gonna have a different opinion, and arguing over it, fighting over it, and every other kind of object, you know, that we can experience. But from the, from the Vipassana wisdom, the wisdom method, we train ourselves to say, just, it's just hearing, hearing. Just sound vibration going in one ear, out the other. 
or it's just smelling, smelling, an odor going in here, going through the nervous system and vanishing. But what does the mind do to it? The mind takes these innocent little vibrations and makes the big bad boogeyman out of it. I hate that, I hate that, I don't like that. Right? And people are arguing and fighting and even killing each other because of their strong attachment to these things, uh, which ultimately only have reality to that person or particular groups of persons. Uh, and, you know, again, you know, the Buddha saw how everything we experience is, is relates and comes back to that phenomenon of our mind. And his sole mission in life was to try to teach people how to understand their minds and change the way that they think and react to uh, the world, to live in accordance with the laws of nature, not living uh, against the laws of nature. <clears throat> so, you know, you know, first we try to see how that is operating within ourself, and then we can understand everybody else. You understand how your own mind operates, and you understand that everybody else's mind basically operates in the same way through their conditioning. So you can have more uh, compassion. It is simply, you know, suffering is caused by ignorance, not by people. You know, it's caused by ignorance. And uh, that everybody has that essential, you know, pure awareness is the source of their consciousness that they, they just lost. So we're trying to learn how to get back in touch with that. And so, you know, one of the, the strongest uh, techniques in the Vipassana, you know, system really is learning how to, you know, identify or you know, label what the mind is doing and thinking about uh, to come back to the to the present moment. You know, sitting, sitting. You hear something, hearing, hearing. You're gonna move the arm, lifting, stretching. And by training yourself to tune into that moment to moment uh, process, then that short circuits the, the, the mind uh, to you know, reacting in other ways. If you don't have anything to clearly think about, then the mind will just go back to its old habits and conditionings. Because it's easier just to continue that, your habits, even though they cause you pain. People go on continuing the habits, don't they? Because it's uh, you know, very difficult to to change the habits. Because no one has told them how to do it in the right way. Uh, and, or it's, they just find it, uh, you know, too difficult. So, anyway, so, you know, every time you go to meditate, you should sit down with the idea of being a scientist. You know, that this body is the laboratory. And the, the microscope is concentrated awareness. Just like if you took a high school or college uh, uh, lab, chemistry lab or biology lab or physics lab, first you have to walk down the hallway of the science department, right? Walk on down the hall, room 101. Biology lab. You just look at the door. Then you have to open the door, right? Then you have to go in. Then you have to sit down at the table. You have to put something under the 
you know, on the slide. And then you got to look down a microscope. And if you're looking down a microscope and you start thinking about, you know, other things, you, you miss what's happening, the cellular movements underneath that. Or if you start, you know, going to sleep. So you have to be wide awake and alert and not distracted. And that's why in the laboratory, the, the microscopes are bolted to the table. And the tables are usually very heavy tables that are bolted to the floor, so they can't be moved. Because if you have a your microscope on a, sitting on a table with, with wheels on it or a flimsy table and people keep coming by and knocking at it and jiggling the, the microscope, it's gonna be difficult for you to see what's happening in there, isn't it? I mean, I don't know, I, I'm crazy. So that's why the posture, you know, we regard this when you sit down, that means you're coming to the door of the lab, means sitting and breathing. In, in, sitting out, you know, you reach the door of the lab, you know, the body, the door, the doorway. Then you have to open the door. Opening the door means you're getting under the skin. Now you're feeling those subtle sensations. So just being aware of like buttocks pressing the floor, hands touching together, clothing touching the skin. That's the, that's the door of the lab. But as you keep your attention there longer and longer, you start feeling those subtler sensations. Now, how many of you could feel some subtler sensations now? You all know what subtler sensations are? Yes, no, maybe so. Okay. And as you keep your attention on the subtler sensations, you can see the minds when you feel, all of a sudden you feel a sharp kind of sensation. You can see the, you know, kind of a, a contraction of the nervous system, like a strong itch or a you know, loud sound. You can see that reaction. And you can then see the, the desire for the pleasurable feeling. You can observe that clearly. And then you can see how the mind, tri that triggers off thoughts about it. I want it, I don't want it. And then that triggers off you know, scheming and planning how you're going to get it or get away from it. And it's doing all these things and it leads up to a point where there's a, there's a decision going to be made. Are you going to get up and change your posture or are you going to sit there and you know, endure the pain longer? Or any other decisions that you might make in life. And so that's really the evolution of the, of the action. You kind of have to trace it back to its start. That's what the Buddha did. You know, he was interested in the cause of suffering. It's very interesting. He was thinking along the lines of cause and effect. What is the cause of suffering? He didn't say cancer. He didn't say somebody stabbing you. He said birth. Is it? The birth ultimately is the cause of suffering. And then he traced it back even further. What's the cause of birth? And so becoming. That means accumulated karma that's going to power the consciousness when it leaves this body. It's going to power it to seek out another life. And what's the source of, of that? It's accumulated karma. And what's the cause of that? It's the, the craving. And he you know, continued back you know, to ignorance. But that's his scientific method. 
That's his scientific investigation. And so that's that's you know what uh, we also can observe when we're. I mean, you know, the Buddha laid that out for us, so you know we don't have to spend too much time. We can just follow his in, instructions uh, and trace our own mind and actions back to that source of you know awareness. And it starts with the contact, contact and feeling. So that's where we start the Paticca Samapada when you're sitting. You know, we're, we're being aware of the contacts, all these contacts coming through the body. Contacts, clothing, touching the skin, things pressing on the skin, coming through the ear and the senses. And then observing the reactions, but then trying to uh, not to to feed them. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I, uh, I talk more about that uh, tomorrow. But I think we've already uh, gone over our time limit. So, uh, but I wanted to make an announcement before we uh, go on. Is that I'm going to be offering some interviews today, you know, personal interviews. And uh, is there anybody who would like to have a personal interview about their meditation uh, practice? It shouldn't be just about some philosophical question or some Dhamma question, but something. Else. So uh, there's a a list outside, and maybe maybe I ought to write those names down now because we might forget it at the end, and and so on. Uh, the people that are raising their hands, could you get that list? 